recording. No, it is. Ah, it's no recording. I could see the indication, sir. Okay. Now I'll pause it. Then. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Chennai Snake Park, I welcome one and all for this uh, wonderful webinar session online. We have with us today uh, an expert entomologist and a taxonomist from the esteemed Zoological Survey of India, uh, Dr. K. A. Subramanian, sir, one of our trustees of Chennai Snake Park and an expert entomologist from ZSI is here with us to impart knowledge and share his uh, work and experience regarding his extensive studies on insect groups. With these few words of introduction, I hand over the session to our guest speaker. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ganesh. It's my pleasure to be part of uh, the activities of uh, Chennai Snake Park. Snake Park. And uh, like uh, being one of the Active, being one of the trustees as official capacity. Like I know the very good activities that Chennai Snake Park Trust is doing in spreading the message of conservation of not only reptiles, but also other group of organisms, especially to youngsters and young school children and others. So today, I am going to introduce you to the world of insects. So this is a very brief introduction to the world of insects. As you know, insects are one of the very commonest organisms that we encounter on a day-to-day -day life. And there are you know, what is most attractive about insects is their sheer diversity, the number of ins insect species that is known, and also the number of uh, in, in terms of abundance that is number that is found, also the various activities they do do in our day-to-day -day life and also to the animal. So, like you might have seen like, large swarms of honeybees, like even in urban areas like Chennai, you can see large swarms of honeybees and you might be wondering what they are doing. But if you think or if you see the data, you know that more than 80% of all the flowering plants and more than 75% of the crops are pollinated by uh, insects, including honeybees. And if honeybees or the pollinators disappear from earth due to some disasters, so soon we will be facing severe food shortage and also ecosystems will collapse because all the plant species and most of the crops are dependent on insects for pollination and their reproduction. So that is why insects are very, very important in our life and also in our ecosystems. If you see the other aspect of insect, if you see the number of people that is dying globally every year. It is more than 7 lakhs people. This is a 2016 data. So more than 7 lakh people die of mosquito bite every year. So nearly 3 lakh people die of mosquito bite. If you compare it with snake bite, it is only about 75% people die every year out of snake bite. And of course, the human beings kill more people than snakes. And human skills, other human beings, more than five lakhs people are killed every year. But mosquitoes, the, the tiny mosquitoes which we see every day and it make a lot of nuisance to our daily life, kill more than eight lakhs people every year. So that is the significance of mosquitoes. So similarly, there are several insects which cause diseases, and I will come to that later, but also are beneficial to human beings. But large number of insects are beneficial to human beings. So insects are very, very successful. So they, they dominate the life on earth. So nearly 80% of our life, of life living organisms on earth are insects. So this is a graphical representation showing that beetles are larger than our vertebrates like mammals or birds. They are very small, so very small in terms of number. But the insects dominate life on earth. So if you look at the, uh, like this is another pictorial representation, if you look at the diversity of life, more than 80% of them are arthropods. And like, large, like mammals, vertebrate constitute only 1% of the total number of species that is so far reported from, from the world. So if you look at insects in India, there are large 
nearly more than 65,000 species of insects are known from India in this like major groups like beetles, uh, butterflies and moths and hymenoclon constitute <coughs> more than 60 percent you know, of total insects known. Then other ins I'll come to these groups later but other groups are very small like for example dragonflies or mayflies they are all very small groups of insects when you compare with total number of uh, insects that is known from me. So the evolution of insects, if you look at it, is highly related with the evolution of the flowering plants. So this graph shows that. So they are evolutionarily very ancient. That is, earlier insects were formed during uh, Carboniferous and they continue to evolve till now. So, but when the angiosperms evolved, the angiosperms of modern flowering plants evolved, insect diversity also increased. So essentially because of the, the, the kind of mutualism and symbiosis they associated with the insects and plants. So pollination evolved and with the pollination and the uh, mutualism of plants and flowering plants and insects evolved, the diversification of insects also started to grow. So they are very highly correlated with the flowering plant diversity and flowering plant evolution. So I also already told you the earliest insects are about 390 million years ago. The oldest insect that is found around, still around us are dragonflies and mayflies. So their evolutionary history dates back to 390 million years ago. But of course the uh, evolutionarily ancient dragonflies and mayflies are extinct now. But the relatives of those ancient dragonflies and damselflies, you can still see them around. So, I already told you the success of insects are associated with diversification of flowering plants. So, the flowering plants develop several mechanisms of, to facilitate the diversification of insects. One is that the, what we call it as evolutionary arms race. So, the, when earlier insects, when the insects were herbivores, so there are several insects are herbivores, so the plants develop several alkaloids and chemicals to prevent insect attack. So similarly, insects also develop several physiological mechanisms to overcome these many several chemicals, several types of phenols, terpenols, and alkaloids. So, so they develop several uh, physiological mechanisms to overcome. So similarly, plants also develop several morphological features and insects also develop several morphological features. So there was an evolutionary arms race. So both of both the flowering plants and insects started evolving together. At one point of time, they developed mutualism. So several plant species, so they have these bright colors to attract um, honeybees and other pollinating insects. And this is an amygdala uh, bee uh, pollinating a flower, garden flower. So similar kind of evolutionary uh, novelties were evolved and insects and plants evolved. So there are other related groups to insects. So insects come under a large group called arthropods. So other evolution uh, related phyla to arthropods are Onechophora. These are the velvet worms and tardigrada. These are the beer animals. So these are our two uh, related groups of organisms that is very closely related to arthropods. But Onechophora is also an evolutionarily uh, living fossil. So very few species are found in tropics. Antarctic radar is a very widespread, minute microscopic organism, which is known to survive in extreme environment, even deep in, in Antarctica and also in very high temperature areas and totally dry conditions. So I'm not going to read about all these uh, terms, but uh, they come under, insects come under a group called phylum arthropods, arthropods. So they're basically joined uh, segmented body and also cuticle is as a well developed exoskeleton and they have compound eyes and they have joint legs and other appendages so that's why they are they are called arthropoda. So there are five subgroups in this one so you may know them by common names there is one is called trilobites and these trilobites are an extinct group of uh, arthropods which is all known only from fossils. Another is crustacea. Crustacea are crabs, prawns, and shrimps. And you have the insecta. Insect is also called hexapoda because they have six legs. So insects are the very widespread. Then you have millipedes and centipedes. 
so they are not insects so they are also very common then you have uh, crabs scorpions horseshoe crabs that is horseshoe crabs scorpions uh, spiders and mites that is the arachnida what we call as the helicon so these are the five <coughs> major groups of arthropoda that is found still living so these are some of the uh, crustaceans that is you commonly found you might have seen them several of them are so short and there are many terrestrial forms are also there then you have this uh, centipedes and millipedes so centipedes and millipedes are also very common and widespread you have then the arachnids that is very common that is scorpions spiders mites ticks so they are also very common usually they are not insects but they are arthropods and they have separate class altogether then comes the insects all these butterflies moths dragonflies all the other flies all other things are called as like insects what we call generally called as insects so if you look at the, uh, the simple phylogeny of insects so there are basically two groups of insects what is called the uh, holometabolous and another is called hemimetabolous so homo holometabolous are the ones which have a true metamorphosis so they have this egg larva pupa and adult stages so the larva is entirely different from the adult they look very different they like butterfly larva looks very different from the butterfly so they undergo this uh, complete metamorphosis it's called complete metamorphosis so they have the egg larva pupa and adult and there is another called hemimetabolous or incomplete metamorphosis so, so this incomplete metamorphosis what happens is that the egg when the egg hatches the nymph what we call as nymph looks very similar to adult but they are they can they, they are very miniature of the adult but they may not have the well developed wings well, well developed wings and they undergo continuous molting to become larger and larger like grasshoppers grasshoppers crickets bugs they all have this hemimetabolous lifestyle so these are the two major groups of insects what we see then there is another group called another i have not another uh, division called the uh, paleoptera and the neoptera so that i am not to put a slide here paleoptera is the old wings all of this especially dragonflies and mayflies are called paleoptera because they cannot fold the wings over the thorax so they have to keep the wings vertically over the thorax like you can see one a uh, dragonfly keeping the wings over the, the other one is a the uh, the common ones like the flies which can keep the wings folded over their abdomen so these are the two uh, major divisions of the insects in evolution so these are some of the uh, common insects what we see uh, these are the called the springtails they are not uh, they are called uh, columbola or called springtails they have about uh, 210 species more species are being discovered so they are mostly found in soils so they are microscopic and you may have seen when you are walking on grasslands or at the lawn you can see them small tiny things jumping so they are called springtails because they jump so they have a small spring like mechanism at the but at the underside of the abdomen which they use it to get a leverage to jump over so they are called springtails so they are all small or very tiny organisms so the this is a soil organism another one groups are called protura so these are all soil organisms very microscopic so only if you do soil studies you can under microscope you can see these organisms they are called protura so we know very little about these groups is only about 20 species are known from india then another very small interesting group is called diplura so these are also very small group of only about 16 species are known in india this is also tiny soil arthropod insect then comes the silver fishes or caesanura so this is everybody might have seen this group and this is one of the very commonest uh, household uh, insect it's called caesanura or silver fishes they are, again they are all very primitive insects without wings and they all uh, they mostly feed on cellulose especially old books and uh, then comes the the insects with wings these are one of the first insects mayflies were the first insects to fly 
in evolutionarily and and the they are called ephemeroptera because they have uh, their adult life is very very little so adult life is very little in the sense that that uh, adults can survive only for one or two days and they are non feeding but most of the life is spent at uh, larval stages and and the larva is aquatic so the mayflies is one of the most primitive group of organisms next comes the dragonflies and damselflies so in india we have about uh, uh, 500 species of uh, dragonflies so people are still discovering new species so these dragonflies and damselflies are also aquatic in the sense that the larval stages are aquatic and adults are terrestrial they are very good the mayflies and dragonflies are very good indicators of uh, aquatic wetland ecosystem health and they are widely used in the mod bio monitoring of wetlands then comes the stone flies they are also aquatic the stone fly larva is aquatic and they are usually found in riparian zones in streams and they mostly found in cold waters very clear pristine unpolluted cold waters especially in hilly regions and the most of the species what we see are from the himalayas so in, in western ghats we have about uh, 12 to 13 species so they are very poor in western ghats but we have very high diversity in the himalayas then comes the embryoptera so web spinners again you can see them in uh, houses especially old houses you can see with lot of uh, then they make web so they live in a tunnel and they uh, they are called web spinners so they, this also very poor species poor in india only about three third three species are known called embryoptera very uh, uh, not so rare but it's it's you need to they used to be found in old bar or under the stone or under the um, fallen log and other things embryoptera then comes the cockroaches cockroaches comes under the order called platodia so these are also very diverse group very important group in terms of uh, litter degradation the nutrient recycling so very important in forest ecosystem and we have about 186 species so termites so, so earlier termites were included and in, under in a different order of sex or isoptera no, but recent studies shows that the termites are also part of a cockroach group and we have about uh, and we have about uh, we have about uh, 253 species of termites that is known from india and as you know termites have very important role in a forest ecosystem and soil nutrient recycling and also recycling of the organic litter organic debris that is being uh, falling into the uh, forest ecosystem and also there are some of them are highly uh, notorious pests and do a lot of damage to uh, wood and old books and other things then we have another groups called uh, grillo blackoidia so this group is not known to occur in india and comes the dermaptera so dermaptera are called ear wings so they have the two uh, fork like uh, structure at the end of the abdomen and the very common insects oil insect and you can see them especially they come to light and uh, dermaptera we have about 320 species of dermaptera then comes the phasmids so leaf insects and stick insects they are very fascinating because of their highly camouflage and mostly found in forest ecosystems or areas with lot of um, vegetation <laughs> the leaf insects and stick insects are also uh, herbivores and we have about 146 species known to occur in india then comes the mandophasmitoidea so this mandophasmitoidea is also known known to occur in india this order is also known to occur 
they are also very rare group only of known to occur in astrichia and the phasmatoidea or gladiator bugs then comes one of the most common insects that is called orthoptera uh, grasshoppers and crickets so we have like recently the everybody might have heard about the a locust outbreak also so this this the locust comes under this orthoptera groups so there are agriculturally very important because several of the several of these uh, locusts and crickets are grasshoppers are pest of agricultural crops and cause serious damage to agricultural crops so they are very very important economically and also they are very good prey to several animals not only animals they are so good prey to several group of organisms especially reptiles uh, amphibians birds even mammals and also some are consumed by human beings some are, some of them are consumed by human beings and uh, economically very important what the are the different grasshopper and crickets sir okay so grasshoppers are laterally flattened is to to put it in simple terms grasshoppers are laterally flat, flattened and their antenna is very short okay. and uh, mostly they are diurnal they usually see them in the daytime another thing is that grasshoppers are as the name indicate they feed on vegetation leaves and grass and other crickets are mostly nocturnal so you can hear crickets most of the crickets are nocturnal and they are dorso ventrally flattened okay not laterally flattened so they are dorso ventrally flattened they are night insects and they they which is the one that make sound at the night and they have very long antenna and mostly of the crickets feed on detritus they don't feed on uh, fresh vegetation they feed on a decaying organic matter so this is a basic difference uh, between grasshoppers and crickets and other group is the mantoidea so mantids are playing mantids everybody might have seen playing mantids so they are predators so they are very important agricultural in terms because they are one of the major biocontrol agents in agricultural ecosystems and also kill several uh, pests and other uh, damage causing insects it's called mantids so we have a large number of species 162 species are known from india so they comes in different forms and different shapes but only a key character is very interesting character is that you can identify all the mantis by looking at their first pair of legs so they can they hold their first pair of legs together as if somebody is doing prayer that's what they are called praying mantis then comes the zooraptera again they are all very tiny minute microscopic insects found in decaying organic matter zooraptera then comes socoptera so socoptera are also called the uh one of the book lies so you might have seen in old books uh, where the small holes are made so the socoptera makes those holes and there you can see them in libraries or even in our old wherever there is a decaying organic matter so they are very important in terms of litter degradation and soil ecosystems you can see the socoptera in such um, so they are also small tiny ones you need uh, microscopes to study them then comes theraptera so the louse so very important in uh, in terms of important vector because they cause several diseases including in humans so like uh, and even animals also so there are more than uh, 400 species of theraptera are reported from india and but only one species uh, attack the uh, infest the human is human head louse so very common I mean, in children especially school going children so this human head louse is uh, the but it is uh, ubiquitous and it is very much evolved with the uh, human system and highly host specific so each how uh, it allows is a host specific so they can, they can live only in that host so several of our wild animals have this arbutus louse then comes the one of the most diverse groups called the hemiptera or bugs mm -hmm. so we have about more than 6000 species people are still discovering 
uh, several new species of bugs. So you have these uh, terrestrial and aquatic bugs. So the terrestrial bugs are mostly in phytophagus. They feed on several crop plants and, and they cause very, very serious damage to all the agricultural products. So they feed on, on the crops. But they have a very interesting mechanism of uh, food consumption because they have very tubular mouth part. So they feed by sucking the plant. So several of them cause serious damage. And some of the bugs, you may have heard about bed bug, but also there are other bugs called the assassin bug, which is not, which is found in India, but actually it causes a disease in South America called Chagas disease and called assassin bugs are there. But several of the assassin bugs are important predators of pests. So they are agriculturally very important. So we have several species of assassin bugs called from the uh, Redubidae family and they cause very, uh, they are very important predators of pests. Then comes Tysonoptera, so called thrips. They are also uh, small ones. Uh, thrips are also small, uh, uh, what do you call very small insects. They call, cause several of the thrips species cause them. They transmit viral diseases in plants. So, so several viral diseases in plants are transmitted by thrips. And thrips also uh, do pollination. So they are very important pollinators also in the plant. And thrips are thrips like uh, they cause several serious damage to agriculture agriculture plants. So, like for example, tomato. Mosaic virus is uh, transmitted by thrips. So, thrips are also agricultural. Very important. Then comes Mycoptera. So, these are also rare insect groups. Only about 15 species are known. So, the Mycoptera are also called as a scorpion flies. And about uh, 15 species are known from India. There, you can see them in forest areas. They are very like very easy to identify by, by looking at their mouth. Like their, their mouth is like some bird beak, like, like a star or a pelican beak, you can see their beak and it's very easy to identify. Then comes the flies. Diptera. So diptera have a two pair of wings, it's called, it's called diptera and we have about uh, more than 6,000 species, people are still discovering several new species. So they are very, very important economically in terms of human health and also in terms of veterinary health because several of the species, especially mosquitoes, sand flies, and sepsi flies, black flies, they all transmit diseases, several diseases. You might have heard about malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and several diseases in human beings and also in uh, veterinary animal, animals also they transmit. So the insects are, the diptera are very important. So several studies are being carried out. There are specialized institutes to study uh, vectors, like the Vector Control Research Center in Pondicherry, which does a uh, very good work on research on insects, or especially vectors. Then comes Siphonoptera, fleas. So everybody might have heard about fleas. So those who are having pets at home, cat or a, a dog might have come across fleas. So these fleas are notorious for their transmission of plague. So human plague is uh, uh, transmitted from rats to human beings by fleas. So nowadays we hear less about plague because of our improved health system, health condition. But once upon a time, historically, this plague was one of the major <coughs> disease that shaped the human history. And this is uh, transmitted by Siphonoptera or fleas. So we have about, uh, about 52 species of fleas in India and they are highly host specific. And human plague is transmitted by rat flea. And then we have cat flea and dog flea. So fleas are very common. Then comes the caddis flies. So these are also aquatic insects. So the larvae live in water and they make very interesting cases. So other than uh, Lepidoptera, the caddis flies, is, the larvae of caddis flies uh, produce silk to make cases to live underwater. So they are, the adults are terrestrial. 
so they also have very long antenna and they also have very colorful so then comes the most common uh, insect which everybody are aware they are called butterflies and moths so in india we have more than 15000 species of butterflies and moths of butterflies there are thousand kinds and the rest of them are moths so they are very colorful so moths are butterflies are very attractive fleas can also uh, infect human beings is it so, so how fleas infect humans the fleas come again uh, i didn't get uh, uh, the pet fleas the fleas uh -huh. uh, can it or uh, live in the human body also i mean if they if we handle pets can it also infect and uh, like a parasite on human body is is it right uh usually usually what happens is that uh they don't uh infest like the fleas because they are highly host specific they don't infest human beings but they bite like we don't have like they like usually they live in kenna konna solla vai thande nine pa they can bite they can bite butterflies huh? they can bite human beings but they insects. don't insects they can uh, they can uh, what do you call they can they cannot infest human beings. like the uh, fleas oh. which live in the human okay okay thank you Shall I continue? Continue, please. Yeah, please. Excuse me, participants. I request all participants to mute themselves unless they are asking question. Sir, kindly continue, sir. Okay. okay then comes the megaloptera called alder alder flies so we have about this um, i didn't put the numbers we have about uh, 24 species of uh, alder flies in india and larva is aquatic and adults are terrestrial so we have only one species in our southern india and all the other 23 species are found in himalaya so they also require a very cold uh, fast flowing streams to live in so they, the larva is highly predaceous they feed on other aquatic uh, insects and adults are terrestrial then comes uh, snake flies so they are also very species for rhipidoptera rhipidoptera so we have one or two species in northeast india so the rest of the species are found outside india so they are also very rare uh, insect groups rhipidoptera then comes uh, lacewing so everybody uh, people might have seen lacewing Uh, especially children uh, when when you are in childhood you might have seen the larva of lacewing in your home which makes a small conical shape uh, nest on the soil especially around walls you can see them the larva of the lacewings so adults are terrestrial and they come to light they are very colorful and sometimes green very green uh, lacewings which they will come to light especially after rains you can see them then comes the most uh, species group most species which groups are uh, coleoptera so the coleoptera are um, very diverse most uh, number of the species are found in coleoptera so globally more than uh, 3 lakh species are found people are still discovering new species so they are very most successful group of insects and most advanced group of insects very colorful comes in different sizes and shapes then there are some parasitic uh, groups of insects called streptera so they are all very poor species for very less number of species called twisted wing flies about 18 species so they live in they parasitize other insects so that's very very rare to see them streptera then comes the most common and very well known groups hymenoptera these are bees wasps and ants so they are also very ubiquitous and found everywhere 
highly successful and you have like more than 10000 species and for example in india we have more than 800 species of ants alone so you can imagine then there are several parasitic hymenopterans and pollinating rasps bees and groups so why uh, like insects generally are very successful because some of the insects have developed sociality what we call it a social social system say for example termites ants and honey bees they are all social insects they live in large colonies and uh, that there will be one queen and in the case of termites and several males and their queen is the one which produces a lot of offsprings and the offsprings take care of the colony and they maintain the colony and the colony grows and grows and they have what we call it as polymorphism so there are different uh, what we call as different uh, same species but different morphology to do different functions so they have soldiers which guard the colonies and there are workers which do all the work and there are foragers who go and get the food I like that in the honeybees also they have different workers honeybee queen honeybee drones so they do different work in ants also you have soldier ants you have the workers you have the queen and the winged ones and the allied ones so all these polymorphism are there and they do in a, in a work in a very organized and uh, organized and uh, what do you call systematically so they are very successful so this is the polymorphism in uh, termites you can see different morphs you have soldiers you have workers and you have queen which do different work males and they live in a large colony and they are highly successful in living as a social insect then comes the ants and the polymorphism you can see queen ant you can see male ant you can see soldier worker caste different shapes of different sizes and shapes of worker caste to do different types of tasks then they have different morphology insects have different morphology one is uh, they have uh, morphology of function and antenna and they different they have different types of antenna to do they can because most of the insects are highly uh, sensitive to chemicals so they understand the world by uh, smelling and they have uh, different shapes of antenna to uh, know what is around and what is around so they have different shapes of antenna say for example dragonfly have very small antenna because they are, their chemical senses are very limited but they have large eyes so that their visual systems are very well so this ceramicid beetle have a very long and very uh, tufted antenna to to sense the chemicals in If you look at an ant, you may think thing, it is a simple ant, but if you look at their chemical mechanisms, we have they have several uh, what we call several uh, glands which produces different chemicals to do different functions. So they are it's a chemical factory. So they have having several functions. So several functions and several uh, glands all over their body to do several things. So that is how they are highly successful. Because they can do, they can understand the entire world by their chemical senses. So this is illustration of an ant uh, by artistic illustration, which showing the different glands and their anatomy and what their functions. As I already told you, they are. having a uh, very important function is pollination so globally now pollinators are declining so it is well known that globally pollinators are declining and that is due to various factors one of the important factors is that, uh, that the kind of different kind of chemicals we are using in the environment especially in agro ecosystem different kind of pesticides we are using and those pesticides are harming the pollinators so uh, pollinators are declining globally and that is we are, we are fearing that soon we are going to have an impact on our food production systems because of decline in pollinators so now there is there is a global awareness to save the pollinators and 
the agriculture production will stop if the, all the pollinators disappear. So that is a very well known fact. And uh, especially bees, honey bees. There are several species of honey bees, both the solitary and we, we, we know only about uh, a colony, colonial honey bees, which make all uh, bee colonies and from where we get honey. But there are several solitary honey bees. So they are solitary species and they are very important in agro ecosystems and especially the food production ecosystems. Then one question. Sir, question. So uh, you are saying pollination, uh, right? So I mean, the uh, flower to fruit. So that is what uh, basically pollination means, right? No, no, so, no. Uh, no, 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 no. Flower yeah. to, no. pollination is the mechanism. Is a reproductive mechanism. So you have in a flower, you have both male and female part. So the anther has to fertilize the uh, female part, that is the ovary. Then only the uh, seed will set. Then the fruit will develop. So then it, the pollination is the mechanism by which the anther, that is the male gamete, is inserted into female gamete and the gamete of zygote is formed. So it is the reproductive mechanism. So in some plants, the, most of the plants, it is cross-pollination. So they, though they may have both male and female part, they cannot pollinate themselves. So one insect will come, insect will come and take the anther from one, in one plant and it will take to the another plant to pollinate. So for example, you can see in this honeybee, there is a yellow part in the leg. So that is the pollen basket. So they will carry the pollen in the leg. So when they visit another flower, this pollen from this plant, this honeybee will fertilize the other flower. So, this is the mechanism of uh, so is, is it the, is it this mechanism is uh, true for all the fruits and uh, vegetables that we get, or is it only pollination requires for specific plants? No, uh, more than eighty percentage of all the plants require pollination, whether it is. Uh, Wild plants or domesticated plants, all the fruits, vegetables. It is so several plants because of the decline in pollination, pollinator. People are doing hand pollination. They are trying to mimic so that the, the you get the fruits. Okay. Okay. So this pollination is not only done by honeybees. So butterflies, several sometimes flies, sometimes thrips. So even even ants do pollination. So most of the even birds do pollination. Like, and uh, most of the flowering uh, bats do pollination. So there is a decline in pollinator all over the world, and uh, especially insect pollinators. But insects are the most efficient pollinators in terms of. So, like if you if you go to places like uh, Punjab, especially during the uh, winter season or during the say, uh, during agriculture season, you can see that uh, people take bee colonies from one place to another so that their mustard fields are pollinated because of the use of heavy use of pesticides the bees have disappeared from all these mustard fields so it's a service paid service to the these uh, honey bee uh, growers do to take the uh, beehives to their mustard fields and they keep their beehives so they are so that their mustards are set oh okay okay thank you thank you So then comes the, you might have seen figs, like our several species of figs. So figs are called uh, keystone species. So what we call it as fig is actually a flower. So it is a flower and uh, it is pollinated by wasps, fig, fig wasps. So for each uh, species of fig, there is a, a specific species of wasp. And this wasp only can uh, pollinate that uh, fig species. So here there is a, a, a picture of fig and fig wasps. So, the what is a very interesting mechanism because the fig, each fig have a hole at the end, at the one side of the fruit. It's not a fruit actually. It's called cyconium. So it's a flower inside. So it's a lot of flowers are inside. So through that one, the female fig, uh, female fig was enters into the flower and lay eggs, and the larva grow inside the fig fruit. 
and during when they grow and they, the fig has comes out it pollinates it pollinates the fig and the fig uh, fig seeds are formed so uh, the most interesting aspect of this one is that if you might have seen fig the so fig is the only tree which doesn't have a season okay so it it has a asynchronous fruiting so that the cycle of pollination is maintained so unlike you have a mango season or a jackfruit season the fig is each if you see fig fruit fig trees it will one tree will fruit or this time so after a few like another tree which may be a neighboring tree which is just standing next to it it will fruit in another time so this is because this is an evolutionary mechanism so that the the, the fig wasp and fig fruits are maintained throughout the year so that the pollination cycle is continuous through the year so that is why these fig, fig trees are called keystone species in any ecosystem so they are keystone species in any ecosystem either it be an urban ecosystem or a forest ecosystem because they provide continuous fruit to the organisms animals and birds they continuously provide fruits because they continuously one fig tree or another fig tree even in summer season or a rainy season or a winter season one fig tree will be always in fruit and flower so that the, the food availability is maintained throughout the year so just to show some uh, historical aspects so this how we came to know about all these insects is by lot of workers who have done uh, very good work in the previous year so like so from the india insects context we came to, we, we know about uh, insects from large last uh, uh, like last 200 years more than 200 years and carolus linnaeus the father of taxonomy had described about 28 insect species in his uh, monumental work oh, yeah. uh, system in nature no problem uh, then you have these uh, earlier workers like Fabricius, uh, 1798, we have uh, like uh, described several species. Then you have uh, Donovan, who has this, uh, made illustrations and also described some insects, many insect species. Donovan. Then you have uh, Drury, sorry, that was Drury, and uh, then you have this uh, Donovan, but made the first natural history of insects of India in about 1800s with several paintings. Then you have this uh, cabinet of oriental entomology by Westwood, where several species of butterflies were illustrated. So these were all in 1800s. Then you have this uh, again Westwood on orthoptera insects, leaf insects, stick insects about 18 and 18. Oh, no, I sent you one um, link. I'm actually, I'm then you have this uh, oh, no. uh, Frederick Muir described the Lopeda uh, Raphaelosaura indica. Several volumes of Raphaelosaura indica, about 10 volumes were the paintings of butterflies were made. This was it's a very monumental work in 1860s. Several species of butterflies are illustrated in it. Then comes uh, people outside India, like the Salis longchamps, described several species of uh, dragonflies from India. Then it is not only the like study of insects has brought out not only the like you know about diversity has brought out major important insights on the evolution of life itself. This is uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace who has done monumental work on insects of uh, Malay Archipelago and described several species of, um, this is his um, uh, Wallace expedition to Malay Archipelago, described several species of uh, beetles and butterflies and also came to know about the, this is a uh, Wallace collection of beetles and beetles from British Museum and also he has described uh, several species of butterflies, especially the birdwing butterflies, which has brought about a very uh, interesting understanding on the evolution of life itself. So the study of insects is not just uh, economically important, but also evolutionarily, intellectually very rewarding. And we also study insects because they are 
very good indicators of uh, ecosystems. So for example, aquatic insects. Why we study aquatic insects? Are, they are very good biocontrol agents. They are very key important components of food web. Easy to sample and study them. And they are food for several, already mentioned, they are food for several vertebrates and invertebrates. And they have very distinct habitat preference and indicators of environmental pollution and stress and predators of aquatic animals and fish. So they are all, they have multiple functions and roles in ecosystems. This is a, just to illustrate, so they are very good predators, even of large, relatively large vertebrates like the frogs, so they can kill frogs, these aquatic beetles can kill frogs and feed them. And they are, some of them are morphologically very interesting. Say for example, this aquatic beetles has a four pair of legs. These burly beetles you might have seen in water surface. So there are four pairs of legs, two to see uh, above the water and two to see under the water. Two pairs to see underwater. So, so simultaneously they can see above and below the water, burly beetles. But globally, the uh, insect, bio, not only insect biodiversity, uh, generally biodiversity in decline. And this, there are several studies, both in the terrestrial freshwater and my, my, uh, marine ecosystems for the last 30, 40 years, the biodiversity components are decreasing, largely because of human interference. Human interference in terms of our consumption, or in terms of our resource use, and indirect drivers like agriculture, hunting, urban and industry, water use, energy and transport as they are putting direct pressure on the ecosystems and several of these species are declining. And because of this decline of uh, uh, biodiversity of not only insects and other components, we are getting poorer ecosystem services because of our uh, resource capital, especially the uh, what we call it as uh, eco eco ecological capital. Which is, uh, which is unquantifiable, is decreasing. Like for example, we are getting our food quality, what we are eating food quality is decreasing because if you talk to your uh, grandparents or your elderly people, you will see that the number of vegetable crops which you used to eat like, like 30, 40 years ago has now decreased drastically because you know we are getting only one or two uh, types of tomato or a brinjal in the market, but earlier people were having or more than 30, 40 varieties of crops because the crop variety is decreasing. The pollinator services are uh, decreasing, as already told you, the pollinators are declining and several species of pollinators are declining. And uh, like, for example, the, because of this decline in biodiversity in general and insect diversity in particular, you will have a decrease in nutrient cycling, you will have uh, photosynthesis, decrease in supporting services and also it is decreasing our uh, what do you call our quality of life so that is a general decline of that happening and several diseases are re-emerging that is infectious diseases are re-emerging and several of these infectious diseases are transmitted by arthropods especially insects like for example, you have a chikungunya fever that is transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes and you have dengue. You have uh, several uh, Rift Valley fever, typhoid, typhus fever, drug resistant malaria, West Nile fever, uh, monkey pox. And all these, these yellow fever, several of these vector bound diseases are, are re-emerging largely because of our interference with ecosystem because we are Several of we are giving opportunities for these vectors to. Uh, we are having close interaction because when the forest is deforestation is happening, or we are doing, we are be, being very proxim, very proximate to these organisms. These diseases are re and reappearing in human history, human civilization, and also, and uh, like uh, for example, urban dengue and urban malaria and urban chikungunya is largely due to our lifestyle changes and we are providing habitats for these organisms to survive because of our unhygienic conditions and also how we are keeping our environment. And as already told you like the biodiversity from 1970s is declining steadily and this is true for all the organisms. So it is, it is known that more than 40 percentages of organisms are under various kinds of threats. And we are in the midst of a sixth extinction, in the sense that uh, 
several species are disappearing like about 25 percentage of the large vertebrates mammals and amphibians 41 percentage of amphibians and in which uh, and 13 percentage of the uh, 13 percentage of birds are under decline so this is only indicate that other organisms associated with these species are also becoming extinct or uh, becoming threatened but only the only thing is that we are not having sufficient data but we know that species are becoming rarer and rarer. So with this, I stop here and I can take uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, very wonderful lecture and giving lots of details about uh, diversity of insects in the country. Uh, participants, any any doubts or questions that you would want to ask, sir? Kindly post it now. Okay. On behalf of Chennai Snake Park, we extend our gratitude to our trustee, sir, Dr. K. Subramanian for his very wonderful and thorough and educative lecture and presentation on the insects of our country and its conservation value. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sir. Ganesh, and uh, thank you, Chennai Snake Park Trust, for giving me an opportunity to interact with you all. If you have any questions, you can email to Dr. Ganesh or to me, it was uh, given in the first slide. I'll be very happy to share my knowledge, share my whatever I can do. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, please click the record button and uh, and uh, before uh, leaving the meeting, sir, kindly click the record button. It will automatically convert the file, sir. Okay, okay, okay. One second. Yes, record button, where is it? Yes, sir. That record round button down below. Once again, sir. Can you do it? Sir was able to do that, sir? No, I am not able to do it. In the chat box. Okay, sir, it says the host has to. So, could you kindly stop that recording and then uh, leave the meeting so that uh, it will it will get uh, saved, converted, and saved, sir? One minute. I'm just able to. Ah, yes, sir. I'm not able to. Sir, sir it will be in a ribbon down below, sir. At the, at the know, it is coming, one. but it is not. I'm not able to click it. Any common insects that bites, uh, uh, I mean, household insects that bites and create nuisance, uh, except mos mosquitoes, sir. I mean, like, I mean, any any bites. How do you manage those bites uh, from those allergies and stuffs? See, mostly, uh, uh, one minute. mostly bites are from mosquitoes. Like, uh, mostly mosquitoes bite, but rarely other insects also bite. Uh, like, especially uh, if you are uh, like. Uh, come across some uh, like bed bugs bite if you have bed bugs at home, but there are uh, other insects that also can bite. Sometimes uh, uh, large spiders may bite, or some like uh, you may get bite from if you have a pet at home, you may get bite from uh, rat flea, sorry, uh, cat flea, uh, cat flea or dog flea, or you have ticks also. So most of these. Um, what you call uh, most of these bites are uh, like some people are allergic so you have to consult a doctor because uh, the right kind of medicine only a doctor can prescribe because uh, uh, because self medication is always dangerous because sometimes it can cause severe side effects so 
that is it. But there are uh, like uh, home remedies, like if you, they, they are not bites actually, but you have ants bite or you have the sting of a wasp for bees that cause. But like uh, for them, you can have like uh, lime people generally apply uh, the, the, what we use it for uh, chewing uh, on the lime and apply as a quick remedy. But most of these are, they are not very dangerous or harmful. But so some people, it can cause uh, allergy. But better okay. to control. Thank you. Thank you, sir.